There's songs about the spring right here. There's songs about the springs over here. There's a deep connection, a relationship that the indigenous people have with this environment, and everything is connected. It's really helpful to think of the desert as an archipelago of tiny little wet places that are separated, it's sort of the ocean inside out. We are part of this land. It's a part of us. We have to learn how to understand it and how to work with it. It's here for us. It's here for everybody. But if we mismanage it, we don't take care of it, we abuse it, we're contaminating it for the next person that's come down the road. We've done a really bad job of maintaining this land. A lot of those people that come from the city, you know, they just think of boats and off-roading. To them, it's just a playground. And to us, it's so much more than that. It's a grocery store. It's our church. That's why we come out here and, you know, check on the well, check on the spring. As indigenous people, we've lived here on this landscape. You know, we have an intimate knowledge of all the plants, the animals. And so our creator said that, you know, we're the protectors of this area. We have to do our part, and that's our part, is to be stewards of this place. This program was made possible in part by a grant from Ann Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy. You have to think back and imagine as you go out into the desert that all these basins were occupied by people. And there were different areas throughout Southern California where people could harvest. And everything was edible back in the day. Go and study it more, you'll find that there was surface water. All you need to take is your water jug and we'll also know where the water sources were, where the springs and seeps were. You have to know the landscape. And now because of westernization and taking in water, all these aquifers are being depleted. I always feel that we have sacrificed our land for development of Los Angeles, Southern California. All these sacred areas, you know, it's in your heart and it's in your spirit. And we are part of this land. It's here for us, it's here for everybody. But if we mismanage it, we contaminate it, we're contaminating it for the next person that's gonna come down the road and we're looking at seven generations that we're trying to protect here. Wow. Never get tired of looking at this place. We're in one of the driest places in North America. A little ways down the road is the, what used to be the settlement of Baghdad. And Baghdad is famous for having the longest stretch in North America in recorded history with no precipitation. But here we have this amazing wetland. a splash of green in one of the driest parts of the Mojave Desert. It's just an absolutely stunning place. We're looking at the entire watershed of Bonanza Spring right here. It's about 60 acres. We've pretty much established that there is a very large aquifer under this spot. It stretches down into the eastern edge of Joshua Tree National Park and most of the way to Las Vegas from here. It's almost entirely water that fell when there was a lot of rain. Back in the Ice Age, there wasn't a whole lot of ice here. There's a lot of rain, so it's called the pluvial here. There were freshwater lakes all over the place. It just soaked down in, and that water is still here. The last time that saw daylight, that water, it might have rolled off the back of a, like a saber-toothed cat, mm -hmm. hit the ground, soaked in. So we're talking about a lot of life, not only animal life, but there's humans that go to these places. We call it Iva'a and Puha. That's the power that people would get from coming to these springs. There was a lot of movement here out on the landscape, and the people would visit their relatives or they'd want to go up to Yosemite for the summer, just as we like to do that now. It was these springs that were just key. If these springs weren't here, the people wouldn't be able to move around. 
These springs are all connected. So this spring is connected to the spring over there at the Old Woman Mountains, connected to the spring over there at Mara. And for a lot of indigenous people, their whole beginning starts at a particular spring. The springs themselves are the underground spiritual highways for the spirits that live inside that water. And you know, these springs are still places of power. They're still places where you can stop and, and rejuvenate and, and heal. It's really helpful to think of the desert not so much as a huge expanse of dry, but as an archipelago of tiny little wet places that are separated. It's sort of the ocean inside out. If you lose one of those islands, it's going to be really devastating. For the first couple centuries of settler experience in the Mojave, very few people actually wanted to be here. About 10 years ago, there was a sign in Barstow on the interstate that said the boredom ends in 90 miles or however far away Vegas was. And it's just that attitude that the desert is something that you speed through as fast as you can, whether it's during the westward migration of the people from Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl or Route 66 era. It was just a place to get through. If people were gonna be here, they needed to get rich. And so there was gold mining, there was silver mining, there was borax mining. The desert really became a place where you went to take things away. It was seen as a big mine. So the idea that this would be sacrificed so that some company could make a little money is ridiculous. For the last 20 years or so, a company called Cadiz Inc. has wanted to pump water out of the ground here and sell it to Southern California City's water agencies. The project stands to do serious damage to Bonanza Spring here and several other springs in the Mojave just by lowering the water table, by pumping way more water than is naturally recharged into the aquifer. And that would have a devastating effect on the wildlife and on the people who depend on these springs for cultural continuity. When the groundwater gets drawn down to the point where the spring dries up, it doesn't come back in three years or 10. It may take centuries for that water to come back, if it ever does. Recently, we've gotten legislation passed on the state level that will prevent this project from happening as long as they aren't able to subvert the process. But at this point, it would be very surprising for the Cadiz project to actually successfully pump water for export. Cadiz is just part of that first tradition of people seeing the value in the desert only in what they can take out of it and sell. And there's a lot more value to the water here. I mean, even in just this one remarkable spring than in all of the subdivisions that Cadiz would support. Oh, it's nice and cold. Feels good. I dig this out right here, make a nice little pool. Oh, it felt great. As indigenous people, we've lived here on this landscape. You know, we have an intimate knowledge of all the plants, the animals, where the trails go. And so our creator, they said that, you know, we're the protectors of this area. These springs were really cared for, they were managed, they were pruned is we would dig them out and clean them out so that the water would always continue to flow to the surface. And that means not planting certain plants in that area that consume more water. It took a lot of human energy to care for these places. They were talked to, they were sung to. We loved them, we treated them like they're one of our own. And so to understand that relationship, I think will really help us manage our, our water into the future. Nahi, 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 Nahi,
for allowing me to be here this morning to, um, to bless the spring, to sing to the spring right here, Creator. And it feels goodness to my heart and makes me feel, makes me feel good, Creator. And you know, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be here and this morning and bring these people out here and share this wonderful place with them. Oh ho. sweet to be in the modern world. We can never go back to our old lifestyles. We can never live like our ancestors lived, but there's little things that we can still carry on that says we are still here. I think the craziest thing about this area is this is really the only concentrated area of petroglyphs here. I was told when it comes to petroglyphs that we didn't create them, that the little people created them. And they were the ones that were guiding us and telling us we have food resources, we have like where the water is. There's little ones here. We call it the fish. Kind of looks like a lizard up there. On the other side, there's a really faded bighorn sheep. And there's some desecration. <laughs> there's some more desecration up there where it says leave. Man, I can't imagine how many more there must have been before the discovery and the chipping took place, you know? This is a main traffic hub, too. A lot of people come out here and they like to go shooting up in the hills right back here. We had come out here a couple summers ago. We brought some elders with us and, you know, we said our prayers and hung out and we were coming back. Some off-roaders just bulldoze through us yeah. and just running over the creosotes, like just no care in the yeah. world. Literally weaving in and out in between our vehicles, just not even minding the trail. We're not against off-road vehicles, we get it, but be respectful to where you're at. It's still a wildlife corridor, you know, follow the trails. To them, it's just a playground. And to us, it's so much more than that. It's a grocery store. It's our church. That's why we come out here and check up on things. And that's why we have, you know, paperwork on paperwork, making sure that, OK, is this petroglyph still here? Is this still here? Let's check on the fence. Let's check on the well. Let's check on the spring. We have to do our part. And that's our part, is to be stewards of this place. I just feel like at this point, if the government really doesn't care, if BLM really doesn't care, but we do, gift it back, give it back to us. There's studies coming out every single day where it's really not that healthy to live in this city. It's not healthy to live on top of each other because, you know, things get concentrated. It's not the way it's supposed to be, you know. You're supposed to be this nomadic kind of community that moves about while utilizing the land each place you go, depending on the season. If you have a village site, you're not gonna stay there long. You're gonna wanna move resources because all your mesquite beans are gonna be gone. The quail and the rabbits, they get smart. The deer get smart. You wanna move so that area can replenish itself. That's what kept these areas going. That's why, you know, the waters were constantly being replenished and not overflowing. It's there. What we knew back then, knowing these water sources, knowing these sacred areas, knowing what you could get out of the desert for resources for food, you know, we used it as we needed it. We didn't exploit it. We didn't take it, you know, just because we wanted it, because we wanted to make extra money or anything like that. We just used it because it was there and it was given to us, you know, naturally. And here's our luscious spring. The story that I remember about my grandma telling me is this is one of the spots that was sacred to us. The hunter had shot up the arrow and it landed here on this spot and created a spring. But a uh, coyote came to pull the arrow out, and when he pulled the arrow out, the spring popped up. So that's, this, that's why we say, like, this whole area right is significant to our people. 
I mean, this is part of our oral history. It sucks that it's off our reservation, and like it would be nice to have all this all back for our people so we can maintain it ourselves, because BLM is definitely not doing it. Maybe one day, you know, we could get tapped in and utilize this as an actual water source once again for us that maybe, you know, it'll kind of set that spark throughout the desert and get everybody to, you know, we need to protect our springs, protect our well water, protect all these little areas like this because this is where the life is of the desert. These are where the main points are. So hopefully our plan of action is to get in here and actually turn it into, you know, something where people can see and look at from a distance and be like, holy cow, this place, there's water in the desert, you know? <laughs> Keep those donkeys out. There's a bunch of reasons it's important to really seek guidance and leadership from our native brothers and sisters. One is that it's their land. This land was never formally ceded to the United States. But also, we've done a really bad job of maintaining this land. The original architects of this ecosystem still remember what needs to be done to make sure that the land is as biologically productive as possible. It's just a really important voice to pay attention to. Despite our intelligence and capacity as humans, sometimes maybe we should step back and let the environment lead. And I think that's a perspective that indigenous people often have always had which is let the environment lead. It knows what it's doing, and it can help guide you in making better decisions. It can help uh, guide us in, in making better policies. If we can educate more about the historical significance of these sites and what their cultural values are, that can give people a deeper understanding of why the landscape has value and what it means, even if it's not from their tradition. The Native American Land Conservancy's mission is to acquire and protect cultural and sacred landscapes. How we look at it is that we're not owning the land such that as an organization we can just do what we want at will with it. We're really just taking care of the land for a limited time because long after we're gone, we want the landscape to still be here. And I think that's a critical difference in ownership. It's not just, I have it, it's mine right now. It's no, I'm merely fulfilling a role to make sure the land is protected so it can be here for everyone later. Our real hallmark of acquisition is the Old Woman Mountains Preserve which is about 2,500 acres, far, far out in the desert. It's a beautiful place. Uh, it has very special properties in terms of its cultural values. And that was the acquisition around which NALC formed back in 1998. So having sites like this, it's an opportunity to teach the general public, maybe who haven't been exposed to these places, how to interact with them in a, in a respectful way and then in a meaningful way. A lot of people would come out with a lot of guns, clay pigeons, would leave lots of glass, trash, do things like desecrating petroglyphs, driving off trails, creating their own trails, just not really respecting the place. Once the NALC got control of this place, we were able to put up fence lines with funding from California OHV and it's helped to limit the flow of traffic through this area. Helps protect the place, not get as torn up. Now we're just trying to restore the native vegetation. This is a section of vertical mulch we did a couple years ago. Vertical mulch is, establishes new growth. You're using dead plants from the area to give chances for the new, younger seedlings to grow. It shelters them from the sun, from wind, helps establish them. You're basically planting sticks in the ground and trying to blend it to the rest of the fauna in the area. And it creates a, a physical barrier as well as a visual barrier to help restore areas that have been decimated by OHV use or heavy trails. It's multifaceted. You're hiding old trails so that people don't take them, but it's also reestablishing the vegetation. 
we mostly just do it where it's needed, where there's any large amount of destruction that's noticeable. You know, just trying to restore the, the beauty of the desert. and Because there's enough out here that you, you still have a chance to explore. There's still so much to see. You don't have to be lazy and drive your vehicle through killing things just to see what's on the other side of that hill. People call it a desert, but it's really, it's a garden. There's so many sources of food and medicine. It's healing just being out here, especially this place. Places like this were a refuge. If you need a place to go, you need healing, go to a place like this and talk to the creator, talk to the mountain. Spirits are here and, and they welcome us, but you gotta come here with clean thoughts and clean minds and take everything in and accept it. It's part of the learning curve of being here is re indigenize yourself, is get familiar with these places, start, start figuring them out yourself. Nobody's gonna teach you, but the most important thing is know your geography, know where you are in this particular place. The Old Woman Mountain site was an awakening to me because I discovered that river map there and other petroglyphs there that were just exposed to me and allowing me to understand what it was. But without knowing the, the landscape, you'd be lost. Where you are is what you see. You, you, have, to, you have to use it with an indigenous mind and indigenous eyes in order for, for you to see these things. But they just don't jump out at you if you don't know what you're looking at. It's a river map of the Colorado River from the confluence of the Bill Williams River and the Colorado River near Parker Dam, extending all the way down to the Gulf. Also, it shows the Gila River coming into the Colorado River. I found this image the first time I was out here, and the lighting conditions were just right. It just stood out. But it's on the sandstone behind you, and it's a lighter image. It starts on the left-hand top. I believe there are other points in that image there that shows all the other springs and seeps from that river map 40 miles out here to the Old Woman Mountains. So without knowing that, you know, uh, people have a hard time trying to navigate the desert if this wasn't there, but they'd have to know how to read it. And that comes with the traditional ecological knowledge that they had at the time, because they knew how to decipher all these images that are out here. It was just, just like reading text in books today to them. but this tells you everything that's here within this place. And that river map tells you how to get here and tells you how to sustain yourself out in the desert. It's all connection. Water has memory, water has thoughts. We can communicate, we can pray to it. We can pray to these rocks, we can pray to this yatam, everything around you. Pray to the sky, pray to the Creator, because we are who we are. Nuk the wats, ma. Nuk nu the wats. That's all I have to say. I'm a Chimwavy man. That's all I am. This program was made possible in part by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy.